A modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people from being a burden to their parents or country, and for making them beneficial to the public, commonly referred to as a modest proposal, is a juvenilian satirical essay, written and published anonymously, by Jonathan Swift in 1729. Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal is a satirical essay meant to underline the problems of both the English and the Irish in 1729. Satire is the use of irony, humor or exaggeration to criticize the ideas of others. It is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town or travel in the country when they see the streets, the roads, and cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children, all in rags and importuning every passenger for an arms. These mothers, instead of being able to work for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all their time in strolling to beg sustenance for their helpless infants who, as they grow up, either turn thieves for want of work, or leave their dear native country, to fight for the pretender, in Spain, or sell themselves to the Barbados. I think it is agreed by all parties, that this prodigious number of children in the arms, or on the backs, or at the heels of their mothers, and frequently of their fathers, is in the present deplorable state of the kingdom. A very great additional grievance. And therefore whoever could find out a fair, cheap and easy method of making these children sound and useful members of the commonwealth, would deserve so well of the public as to have his statue set up for a preserver of the nation. But my intention is very far from being confined to provide only for the children of professed beggars. It is of a much greater extent, and shall take in the whole number of infants at a certain age, who are born of parents in effect as little able to support them, as those who demand our charity in the streets. As to my own part, Having turned my thoughts for many years upon this important subject, and maturely weighed the several schemes of our projectors, I have always found them grossly mistaken in their computation. It is true, a child just dropped from its dam, may be supported by her milk, for a solar year, with little other nourishment. At most not above the value of two shillings, which the mother may certainly get, or the value in scraps by her lawful occupation of begging. And it is exactly at one year old that I propose to provide for them in such a manner, as, instead of being a charge upon their parents, or the parish, or wanting food and raiment for the rest of their lives, they shall, on the contrary, contribute to the feeding, and partly to the clothing of many thousands. There is likewise another great advantage in my scheme that it will prevent those voluntary abortions, and that horrid practice of women murdering their bastard children. Alas! too frequent among us, sacrificing the poor innocent babes. I doubt, more to avoid the expense than the shame, which would move tears and pity, in the most savage and inhuman breast. The number of souls in this kingdom being usually reckoned one million and a half, of these I calculate there may be about two hundred thousand couple, whose wives are breeders, from which number I subtract thirty thousand couple, who are able to maintain their own children. Although I apprehend there cannot be so many under the present distresses of the kingdom, but this being granted, there will remain a hundred and seventy thousand breeders. I again subtract fifty thousand, for those women who miscarry, or whose children die by accident or there only remain a hundred and twenty thousand children of poor parents annually born. The question therefore is, how this number shall be reared and provided for. Which, as I have already said, under the present situation of affairs, is utterly impossible by all the methods hitherto proposed. For we can neither employ them in handicraft or agriculture, they neither build houses. I mean in the country, nor cultivate land. They can very seldom pick up a livelihood by stealing till they arrive at six years old. 
except where they are of towardly parts. Although I confess they learn the rudiments much earlier. During which time they can however be properly looked upon only as probationers. As I have been informed by a principal gentleman in the county of Cavan, who protested to me, that he never knew above one or two instances under the age of six. Even in a part of the kingdom so renowned for the quickest proficiency in the tart. I am assured by our merchants, that a boy or a girl, before twelve years old, is no saleable commodity. And even when they come to this age, they will not yield above three pounds. Or three pounds and half a crown at most. On the exchange. Which cannot turn to account either to the parents or kingdom. The charge of nutriments and rags having been at least four times that value. I shall now therefore humbly propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young healthy child well nursed is, at a year old, a most delicious nourishing and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled. And I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragust. I do therefore humbly offer it to public consideration. That of the hundred and twenty thousand children, already computed, twenty thousand may be reserved for breed, whereof only one fourth part to be males. Which is more than we allow to sheep, black cattle, or swine, and my reason is that these children are seldom the fruits of marriage, a circumstance not much regarded by our savages. Therefore, one male will be sufficient to serve four females. That the remaining hundred thousand may, at a year old, be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune, through the kingdom. A child will make two dishes at an entertainment for friends. And when the family dines alone, the fore or hind quarter will make a reasonable dish. And seasoned with a little pepper or salt will be very good boiled on the fourth day, especially in winter. I have reckoned upon a medium, that a child just born will weigh twelve pounds. And in a solo year, if tolerably nursed, increaseth to twenty-eight pounds. I grant this food will be somewhat dear, and therefore very proper for landlords. Who, as they have already devoured most of the parents, seem to have the best title to the children. Infants' flesh will be in season throughout the year, but more plentiful in March. And a little before and after, for we are told by a grave author, an eminent French physician, that fish being a prolific diet. There are more children born in Roman Catholic countries about nine months after Lent, than at any other season, therefore, reckoning a year after Lent, the markets will be more glutted than usual. Because the number of popish infants, is at least three to one in this kingdom. And therefore it will have one other collateral advantage, by lessening the number of papists among us. I have already computed the charge of nursing a beggar's child, in which list I reckon all cottagers, labourers, and four-fifths of the farmers, to be about two shillings per annum, rags included. And I believe no gentleman would repine to give ten shillings for the carcass of a good fat child, which, as I have said, will make four dishes of excellent nutritive meat, when he hath only some particular friend, or his own family to dine with him. Thus the squire will learn to be a good landlord, and grow popular among his tenants. The mother will have eight shillings neat profit, and be fit for work till she produces another child. Those who are more thrifty, as I must confess the times require, may flay the carcass. The skin of which, artificially dressed, will make admirable gloves for ladies, and summer boots for fine gentlemen. As to our city of Dublin, shambles may be appointed for this purpose. In the most convenient parts of it, and butchers we may be assured will not be wanting. Although I rather recommend buying the children alive. And dressing them hot from the knife. As we do roasting pigs. A very worthy person, a true lover of his country, and whose virtues I highly esteem. 
was lately pleased in discoursing on this matter, to offer a refinement upon my scheme. He said, that many gentlemen of this kingdom, having of late destroyed their dear, he conceived that the want of venison might be well supplied by the bodies of young lads and maidens, not exceeding fourteen years of age. Nor under twelve, so great a number of both sexes in every county being now ready to starve for want of work and service. And these to be disposed of by their parents if alive, or otherwise by their nearest relations. But with due deference to so excellent a friend, and so deserving a patriot, I cannot be altogether in his sentiments, for as to the males. My American acquaintance assured me from frequent experience that their flesh was generally tough and lean, like that of our schoolboys, by continual exercise. And their taste disagreeable, and to fatten them would not answer the charge. Then as to the females, it would, I think, with humble submission, be a loss to the public, because they soon would become breeders themselves. And besides, it is not improbable that some scrupulous people might be apt to censure such a practice although indeed very unjustly, as a little bordering upon cruelty, which, I confess, hath always been with me the strongest objection against any project, how well soever intended. But in order to justify my friend, he confessed, that this expedient was put into his head by the famous Samarnaza, a native of the island Formosa, who came from thence to London, above twenty years ago. And in conversation told my friend, that in his country, when any young person happened to be put to death, and that, in his time, the body of a plump girl of fifteen, who was crucified for an attempt to poison the emperor, was sold to his imperial majesty's prime minister of state, and other great mandarins of the court in joints from the gibbet, at four hundred crowns. Neither indeed can I deny, that if the same use were made of several plump young girls in this town, who without one single groat to their fortunes, cannot stir abroad without a chair, and appear at a playhouse and assemblies in foreign fineries which they never will pay for, the kingdom would not be the worse. Some persons of a desponding spirit are in great concern about that vast number of poor people, who are aged, diseased, or maimed and I have been desired to employ my thoughts what course may be taken, to ease the nation of so grievous an encumbrance. But I am not in the least pain upon that matter, because it is very well known, that they are every day dying, and rotting, by cold and famine, and filth, and vermin, as fast as can be reasonably expected. And as to the young labourers, they are now in almost as hopeful a condition. They cannot get work, and consequently pine away from want of nourishment, to a degree, that if at any time they are accidentally hired to common labour, they have not strength to perform it, and thus the country and themselves are happily delivered from the evils to come. I have too long digressed, and therefore shall return to my subject. I think the advantages by the proposal which I have made are obvious and many as well as of the highest importance. For first, as I have already observed, it would greatly lessen the number of papists, with whom we are yearly overrun, being the principal breeders of the nation, as well as our most dangerous enemies, and who stay at home on purpose with a design to deliver the kingdom to the pretender, hoping to take their advantage by the absence of so many good Protestants who have chosen rather to leave their country, than stay at home and pay tithes, against their conscience to an episcopal curate. Secondly, the poorer tenants will have something valuable of their own, which by law may be made liable to a distress, and help to pay their landlord's rent, their corn and cattle being already seized, and money a thing unknown. Thirdly, whereas the maintenance of a hundred thousand children, from two years old, and upwards, cannot be computed at less than ten shillings a piece per annum. The nation's stock will be thereby increased fifty thousand pounds per annum. Besides the profit of a new dish, introduced to the tables of all gentlemen of fortune in the kingdom, 
who have any refinement in taste. Fourthly, the constant breeders. Besides the gain of eight shillings sterling per annum by the sale of their children, will be rid of the charge of maintaining them after the first year. Fifthly, this food would likewise bring great custom to taverns, where the vintners will certainly be so prudent as to procure best receipts for dressing it to perfection, and consequently have their houses frequented by all the fine gentlemen, who justly value themselves upon their knowledge in good eating, and a skilful cook, who understands how to oblige his guests, will contrive to make it as expensive as they please. Sixthly, this would be a great inducement to marriage, which all wise nations have either encouraged by rewards, or enforced by laws and penalties. It would increase the care and tenderness of mothers towards their children, when they were sure of a settlement for life to the poor babes, provided in some sort by the public, to their annual profit instead of expense. We should soon see an honest emulation among the married women. Which of them could bring the fattest child to the market? Men would become as fond of their wives, during the time of their pregnancy, as they are now of their mares in foal, their cows in calf, or sows when they are ready to farrow, nor offer to beat or kick them, as is too frequent a practice, for fear of a miscarriage. Many other advantages might be enumerated. For instance, the addition of some thousand carcasses in our exportation of barreled beef, the propagation of swine's flesh, and improvement in the art of making good bacon, so much wanted among us by the great destruction of pigs, too frequent at our tables, which are no way comparable in taste or magnificence to a well-grown, fatty ailing child, which roasted whole will make a considerable figure at a Lord Mayor's feast or any other public entertainment. But this, and many others, I omit, being studious of brevity. Supposing that one thousand families in this city, would be constant customers for infants' flesh, besides others who might have it at merry meetings, particularly at weddings and christenings. I compute that Dublin would take off annually about twenty thousand carcasses and the rest of the kingdom, where probably they will be sold somewhat cheaper, the remaining eighty thousand. I can think of no one objection, that will possibly be raised against this proposal, unless it should be urged, that the number of people will be thereby much lessened in the kingdom. This I freely own, and was indeed one principal design in offering it to the world. I desire the reader will observe, that I calculate my remedy for this one individual kingdom of Ireland, and for no other that ever was, is, or, I think, ever can be upon earth. Therefore let no man talk to me of other expedients, of taxing our absentees at five shillings a pound, of using neither clothes, nor household furniture, except what is of our own growth and manufacture of utterly rejecting the materials and instruments that promote foreign luxury, of curing the expensiveness of pride, vanity, idleness, and gaming in our women, of introducing a vein of parsimony, prudence and temperance, of learning to love our country, wherein we differ even from Laplanders, and the inhabitants of Topinambu, of quitting our animosities and factions, nor acting any longer like the Jews who were murdering one another at the very moment their city was taken. Of being a little cautious not to sell our country and consciences for nothing. Of teaching landlords to have at least one degree of mercy towards their tenants. Lastly, of putting a spirit of honesty, industry, and skill into our shopkeepers. Who, if a resolution could now be taken to buy only our native goods would immediately unite to cheat and exact upon us in the price, the measure, and the goodness. Nor could ever yet be brought to make one fair proposal of just dealing, though often and earnestly invited to it. Therefore I repeat, let no man talk to me of these and the like expedients. Till he hath at least some glimpse of hope, that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempt to put them into practice. But, as to myself, having been wearied out for many years with offering vain, idle, visionary thoughts, 
and at length utterly despairing of success. I fortunately fell upon this proposal, which, as it is wholly new, so it hath something solid and real. Of no expense and little trouble, full in our own power. And whereby we can incur no danger in disobliging England. For this kind of commodity will not bear exportation. And flesh being of too tender a consistence. To admit a long continuance in salt, although perhaps I could name a country. Which would be glad to eat up our whole nation without it. After all, I am not so violently bent upon my own opinion, as to reject any offer. Proposed by wise men, which shall be found equally innocent, cheap, easy, and effectual. But before something of that kind shall be advanced in contradiction to my scheme, and offering a better, I desire the author or authors will be pleased maturely to consider two points. First, as things now stand, how they will be able to find food and raiment for a hundred thousand useless mouths and backs. And secondly, there being a round million of creatures in humane figure throughout this kingdom, whose whole subsistence put into a common stock, would leave them in debt two million of pounds sterling, adding those who are beggars by profession, to the bulk of farmers, cottagers and labourers, with their wives and children, who are beggars in effect. I desire those politicians who dislike my overture, and may perhaps be so bold to attempt an answer, that they will first ask the parents of these mortals, whether they would not at this day think it a great happiness to have been sold for food at a year old, in the manner I prescribe, and thereby have avoided such a perpetual scene of misfortunes, as they have since gone through, by the oppression of landlords, the impossibility of paying rent without money or trade, the want of common sustenance, with neither house nor clothes to cover them from the inclemencies of the weather, and the most inevitable prospect of entailing the like, or greater miseries, upon their breed forever. I profess in the sincerity of my heart, that I have not the least personal interest in endeavouring to promote this necessary work, having no other motive than the public good of my country, by advancing our trade, providing for infants, relieving the poor, and giving some pleasure to the rich. I have no children, by which I can propose to get a single penny, the youngest being nine years old, and my wife past childbearing. A modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people from being a burthen to their parents or country, and for making them beneficial to the public, commonly referred to as a modest proposal, is a juvenile and satirical essay written and published anonymously by Jonathan Swift in 1729. The essay suggests that the impoverished Irish might ease their economic troubles by selling their children as food to rich gentlemen and ladies. This satirical hyperbole mocked heartless attitudes towards the poor, as well as British policy toward the Irish in general. In English writing, the phrase a modest proposal is now conventionally an allusion to this style of straight-faced satire. Summary and Analysis of a Modest Proposal A modest proposal begins with an account of the impoverished state of many in Ireland. The writer expresses sympathy and the need for a solution. This proposal hopefully will decrease the number of abortions performed by poor mothers. The writer calculates the number of infants born in Ireland and asks what should be done with them. He points out that they are unfit for any employment, being even too young to steal. Neither will merchants buy or sell children. Therefore, it seems like a good idea that the people of Ireland simply eat the infants when they reach the age of one year. The writer treats the weight of an infant, what kind of dish it will make, and how many people it will serve. He surmises the times of year when the infants will be most plentiful, based on the purported sexual patterns of the Irish. There might also be uses for the discarded skin of the infants, such as for ladies' gloves. A friend of the narrator's, a very worthy person, has already heard the proposal and suggested that children of fourteen, too, be a potential food. The writer has dismissed this idea, though because the flesh of 14-year-old boys is too lean. 
and 14-year-old girls might soon become breeders of infants themselves. He defends his friend, nevertheless, by saying that the friend learned of this practice in Asia among certain savage peoples. This digression continues with the observation that he is unconcerned about those adults who are ill, disabled, or starving, because there is nothing he can do for them. He returns to the chief proposal and lists six reasons why it should be adopted. First, it will decrease the number of dangerous Catholics. Second, it will give the poor some property. Third, it will increase the nation's overall wealth, since people will not have to pay for the upkeep of the children. Fourth, the mothers will be free of the burden of bringing up children. Fifth, the new food will be welcomed in taverns and culinary circles. Sixth, it will enhance the institution of marriage as women take better care of their infants so that they may be sold. And men will take better care of their wives so that their wives can make more babies to sell. Swift then raises a potential objection to his proposal, that it will deplete Ireland's population. Swift responds by saying that this is the point. He says that this proposal will in no way encumber England. As the infants will not be able to be exported, as their flesh is not easily preserved for later consumption. He is not willing to entertain any other arguments for solving the problem, like virtue and thrift. Swift concludes by saying first that he would welcome any other suggestions anyone may have on this question. Then assuring the reader that he has no personal economic stake in this idea because he has no children and therefore could not profit by selling them to be eaten. Analysis of the essay. If you do not realize that this proposal is satirical, you have no sense of humor or irony. It is impossible to imagine a serious proposal for eating children. Yet, it is not enough simply to indulge one's outrage over the argument or to smile at the jokes. Is Swift just having fun, or does he have something serious to say? Stereotypes against Irish Catholics make it easier for Swift to use them as the subject of his satire. The stereotypes are present in both the reasons for the proposal and the language used. The narrator's argument that something must be done with infants because they are too young to steal implies that this is a common employment of Irish Catholics, even while it is humorous apart from the stereotype. The overall idea of overpopulation comes from the stereotype that Catholics tend to have a lot of children. The first reason Swift's narrator gives for adopting his proposal, that it will lessen the number of Catholics is perhaps the best example of satire of religious prejudice in the piece. Furthermore, he uses the word papists in the offensive sense of anti-Catholic rejection of the Pope. In Protestant England, many people might share the stereotypes but would never go so far as the speaker suggests about eating children. The theme of prejudice against the lower classes is revealed in suggestions such as the idea that the carcasses of the poor children could be used for clothing, women's gloves. Swift suggests, with this extreme example, as well as his declaration that the landlords have already devoured the poor infants' parents, that the rich live at the expense of the poor. By referring next to another figure, a very worthy person, who is meant to represent a member of the upper, learned classes. Swift furthers his satire of the upper classes by implying that there are people so disconnected from the lower classes that they might agree with this outlandish proposal. Swift's aim, however, was not merely to expose England's biased view of Ireland or to illuminate general English arrogance towards other peoples, although the latter aim is achieved. The narrator's statement that an American told him that children are delicious parodies the idea that the Americans, like the Irish, were considered to be a barbaric people in need of instruction from the English. So, too, does the reference to the island of Formosa evoke a kind of English cultural arrogance? All people who could be classified as other are potentially dangerous to the English, needing to be tamed. A modest proposal is also literary commentary. Swift intended to parody similar pamphlets that were being circulated at the time. His diction throughout the piece, including the word modest in the title, highlights this effect. Of course, one's proposals are modest and offered humbly. With word choice like this, Swift is mocking the false modesty in the tone of many of the pamphlets of his contemporaries. 
Their style may have professed deference, but their proposals displayed audacity. Swift finally gets down to some real arguments when the narrator lists all the arguments that he will not give any time to, if eating the children were off the table. The people would have to turn to realistic arguments like these, such as the encouragement of virtue and thrift. A modest proposal is accurately called one of the most effective satires in the English language. There are a few key moments of satirical success that should be mentioned. Swift's decision to put off the actual suggestion of eating babies until several paragraphs into the piece makes his idea all the more arresting when it does come. Also, naming population decrease as the one potential objection to his proposal. Swift heightens the irony of an already ironic piece. The reader is expecting this objection to be that it is morally wrong to kill babies, but Swift subverts our expectations once again suggesting that there are people so cold to the reality that they could be swayed by merely practical economic arguments and cannot even see the outrage of cannibalism. Finally, when the writer reassures the reader that he has nothing to gain economically from his proposal, for he has no children, Swift is playing on the common protestation of writers that their political and social proposals are made altruistically for the good of society and should, therefore, be believed to be all the more sincere. If the writer did have children and lived in Ireland, it would be consistent to eat them or sell them.